Everyone, I'm really excited to introduce our next video. We are calling this ECMO 101. And wow, I think this will be really useful for students or residents on surgery. This is really a broad topic and should probably be presented by somebody who is not a simple surgery resident like myself. So I have recruited a, an expert, a cardiology fellow to really talk to you about a high level, level overview of what ECMO is and what we use it for. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases. And with that, let's get started. I'll hand it over. Great. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. So I want to introduce to you the topic of ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And in order for you to understand it, at its very simplistic form, everything's just like most things in medicine, everything is in the name. So extracorporeal just means outside of the body. Membrane is a gas exchange membrane that we'll talk about. And then oxygenation. So it's a process that adds oxygen to a patient's blood. So I want you to understand this is something that we use. It's sort of an end stage measure for patients who are really, really sick. And uh, we refer to this as basically portable heart lung bypass. So looking a little bit closer at the components of an ECMO circuit. So these patients have large bore cannulas, which are essentially really big catheters that are about the size of garden hoses. One of them sits in the patient's vein of some sort, and there's a couple configurations that we'll talk about. But essentially what I want you to know is there's a cannula sitting in the patient and blood is coming from inside the patient into a pump, which is a centrifugal flow pump. And essentially what, what that means is it's a continuous flow pump that doesn't generate any amount of pulse like the native heart does. Blood goes from the pump into an oxygenator where oxygen is added to the blood and carbon dioxide is removed. And that is your membrane part of the ECMO or ECMO part of that uh, mnemonic. And then after the, the blood is oxygenated through that membrane, it is infused back into the patient again through one of those garden hose size cannulas. So there's a couple of different configurations of ECMO that we see commonly. Do you know what those configurations are? Yeah, so there's two main configurations, uh, veno-venous or VV or veno-arterial or VA. And the differences are all about the way the blood is returned to the patient. So the one we're seeing here, I believe, would be an example of VA or veno-arterial ECMO. Great, exactly. So there are two major types uh, that you should know about. One is called veno-venous or VV ECMO. And then the other major type is veno-arterial or VA. There are other configurations that we won't belabor the point of going into here, but can be addressed in a future video if you guys are interested. So to delve in a little bit more to what each of those configurations mean. So here is a patient who is on VV ECMO. And essentially, in this con configuration, the patient is cannulated with a femoral internal jugular approach, where they have one of those large bore garden hose cannulas sitting in their right femoral vein. That blood is being pulled from the femoral vein into the pump oxygenator membrane system. And then after oxygen is added, carbon dioxide is removed. That's returned back to the patient fully oxygenated into their right internal jugular vein. For veno-arterial ECMO or VA ECMO, this is a femoral-femoral cannulation setup where, again, this patient has a cannula sitting in their right femoral vein that's extracting deoxygenated blood. This goes, again, into the pump oxygenator membrane setup and then after gas exchange occurs, it's pumped back into the patients here into their left femoral artery and provides oxygenated blood to the arterial circuit. I want you to remember, so the VV ECMO 
So you can tell this is really for patients who have lung failure. So essentially they have some sort of problem with their lung that is their lungs are not able to oxygenate this blood effectively. In patients with VA ECMO, they can have heart problems or heart and lung problems where they can't effectively pump blood or oxygenate blood. So with that in mind, I want to talk about some of the common indications for both of those. Can you think of some indications for VV ECMO? Yeah, so when we think about the two different types of ECMO, like you were just saying, VV ECMO really just gives you oxygenation or uh, surrogate lung function, whereas VA ECMO will also bypass the lungs and give you oxygenated blood, but it will also provide some cardiac support if your cardiac if your cardiac system is not able to meet the needs of your body. So when I'm thinking about VV ECMO, I'm thinking about lung problems. So pro- probably the most common would be ARBS, whether that's from pneumonia or some other type of pro-inflammatory insult. And then other issues might be things like massive PEs, et cetera. Great. So that's exactly right. So again, to reemphasize this, VV ECMO, I want to want you to think about it being related to respiratory failure or lung failure. And some of the most common causes being ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or adult respiratory distress syndrome from a variety of causes, including pneumonia, drug intoxication, for example, as well as uh, other causes such as massive PE or status asthmaticus. And then VA ECMO is a heart and lung bypass circuit. Um, so, So patients are on this usually primarily for some problem with cardiac failure or primary heart failure. And this can be patients who are coming in after a a massive heart attack or myocardial infarction, or patients who have longstanding heart failure and develop what we call cardiogenic shock. Uh, The other case where we do use this is what we call eCPR, which is essentially extracorporeal Uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So essentially we use the VA ECMO circuit uh, as in order to completely bypass the heart and lungs and provide continuous flow. And we can use this actually instead of people doing chest compressions. In terms of contraindications to either VV or VA ECMO, can you think of uh, some general contraindications to this? Yeah, so when I think of contraindications, really ECMO is a major intervention and should only be undertaken when it's really needed. And in that case, when you think about ECMO being support of the heart or lungs, this means your patient is going to die if they don't get ECMO, usually very acutely. So times when you wouldn't want to use it are if the cause of if the need for ECMO is not reversible. So if they have some sort of really bad heart or lung problem that you cannot put them on ECMO, reverse the problem and then take them off, or if they could get a transplant, those would be times you could do it. But if you can't do that, you don't want to put somebody on ECMO and have no way to ever wean them off of it. Perfect. I think you really hit the nail on the head there. So Really, the major absolute contraindications are if any patient has a life-limiting illness, particularly a malignancy, a metastatic cancer of some sort, where the prognosis has been given to the patient of months to less than a year, that's not someone who would generally benefit from ECMO. Similarly, someone who has a a devastating neurologic injury, and that can be someone who has a traumatic brain injury and is close to brain death or someone who has a hemorrhagic stroke, things that these patients wouldn't be expected to survive the hospital stay. Those are generally not recommended uh, patients to to be cannulated with ECMO. The other uh, contraindication is for, you know, I want to want you to think about ECMO being a bridge to something. ECMO should always be a bridge to something. And in a younger, healthier patient who was previously healthy and came in with something like a massive pulmonary embolus that could be a bridge to recovery. But in a lot of these patients, ECMO is a bridge to either heart or lung transplantation or some sometimes even both. So if these patients for some reason are not transplant candidates, uh, 
um, that would be an absolute contraindication to, to going on ECMO if it was a bridge to, to nothing. And this is really decided with a multidisciplinary approach with the medical team, surgical team, transplant team, et cetera. Some relative contraindications you should be aware, aware of because the, the ECMO is a continuous flow pump with a lot of different parts uh, that and those parts can be stagnant and form clots on them. All of these patients are on anticoagulation. So any inability to tolerate anticoagulation, for example, with people with some degree of bleeding, and that can be GI bleeding or bleeding after a trauma, for example. Age is sort of an interesting one. It's a little bit controversial. Um, there's not really a fixed age where you stop doing ECMO, but generally people are more unwilling to put older people on ECMO. And then, of course, if you have uh, an unwitnessed cardiac arrest and then um, damage to the aorta itself, and that can be aortic dissection or aortic insufficiency or regurgitation can be contraindications as well. In terms of things to monitor or what to report on rounds, you should know that uh, every patient who is on ECMO has an ECMO specialist who is at their bedside 24-7, and they can be your best friend in terms of helping you out and in knowing what's gone on with the patient and the ECMO circuit overnight. But in general, uh, the most common parameters for you to report are speed, which is a set parameter in rotations per minute. And that just tells you how, uh, essentially how much the, um, or what speed the, the pump is flowing at. Uh, flow is derived or calculated based on the set speed. Sweep is essentially the rate of gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then the oxygen concentration is also set. It's usually 100% um, and usually doesn't change. Uh, but those are sort of the four parameters that you see on the ECMO screen that you should report on rounds on a daily basis. In terms of anticoagulation, as I mentioned, these patients are generally on a heparin drip. And here is an example of a dreaded complication. Again, this circuit has no blood in it, but you can see here are all sorts of clots that have formed on the membrane. Um, obviously, these filters and the membranes are checked by the ECMO specialists multiple times a day. This, any clots that form on the filter uh, can impair your oxygen delivery. They can decrease flow. And obviously, there's the risk of these particularly on veno-arterial circuits that these embolize and can cause things like stroke, limb ischemia, or really clots anywhere the arterial circuit goes. There are multiple labs that we get uh, on patients with ECMO. Um, obviously, they get monitoring for their anticoagulation with their heparin, and that can be ACTs, PTTs, anti-10As, uh, based on uh, what your institution does. We also check uh, coagulation parameters, particularly looking for DIC. Um, you can also look for hemolysis with LDH and haptoglobin. You can also monitor a patient's urine output. The darker it gets, uh, the more likely they have myoglobin in their urine, and that can be something you can quickly check at bedside. Also, uh, we get blood gases from the patient as well as lactates. And then a BMP, you can imagine just to monitor kidney function and electrolytes, and then of course a CBC to keep an eye on hemoglobin and platelets. And then we get daily chest x-rays on these patients to look at the cannula positions. I wanna give you guys an example of two sort of common phenomena. One, uh, one common problem with VV ECMO and one common problem with VA ECMO. So, this is a phenomenon called recirculation. And essentially, you can imagine with the way VV ECMO is configured, remember you have one cannula that's draining blood from a vein, usually the IVC, and then it's being reinfused into the patient. This is through the SVC. So essentially, recirculation means what that instead of blood going through the right ventricle 
as it should, kind of out to the lungs, etc. Blood is being drained back into the drainage cannula and is essentially creating sort of this fixed loop where blood is never actually getting back. This oxygenated blood is never getting to, out to the patient, which you can imagine sort of defeats the purpose of why we put this patient uh, on VV ECMO to begin with. Usually this is fixed just by repositioning the cannulas, but again, this recirculation phenomenon is just something I want you to be aware of. And so when you reposition, you usually just want to move the cannulas farther apart so they're not as likely to recirculate? Exactly. So by withdrawing the cannulas further apart, so if you move this cannula sitting in the IVC further down and move the cannula sitting in the SVC further up, this reduces the risk that blood uh, is going to shoot straight down into this drainage cannula and increases your chances that more blood is going to go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, et cetera, uh, the way that we'd like it to. And then a, an issue unique to VA ECMO only. Um, so this is a little bit complicated to think of, but I want you to remember the term mixing cloud. It's something you'll hear quite a bit um, with VA ECMO patients. Um, so as you guys know, blood from a native properly working left ventricle goes antegrade and gives blood to all of the branches of uh, off of the aortic arch. So normally with a VA ECMO circuit, blood is actually pumped the opposite of what you would expect retrograde, right? And blood coming back from the VA ECMO circuit into the arterial side, it needs to be pumped retrograde so that all of the oxygenated blood is serving all of these branch vessels, right? Because we want oxygenated blood getting to all of these branch vessels, most importantly, the carotids um, to ensure adequate cerebral blood flow and oxygen. So there is always some degree of pump function coming from the left ventricle. And then that mixes with the blood coming back from the ECMO circuit. And that's what we call this mixing zone or mixing cloud. And essentially what we want to do is monitor for where that mixing cloud is. Generally the mixing cloud with someone with poor pump function is somewhere in the ascending aorta. But as patients start to have increasing native heart pump function or their ECMO speeds or flows are turned down, that mixing zone or mixing cloud will start to shift. The first place that will be affected is the first branch off of the aortic arch, which is the right bronchocephalic artery or trunk. So all of these patients have a right radial or brachial arterial line because what we monitor is the oxygen saturations off the blood gas off of that first branch because we can keep an eye essentially on exactly where that mixing cloud is. And if the sats start to drop off of that right radial arterial line, we can tell that the mixing cloud has started to shift. And that can suggest that either the patient is having recovery of their heart pump function or that the ECMO flows need to be turned up. And then another concept I want you guys to understand is pulse pressure. So remember, we talked initially about uh, ECMO being a continuous flow pump, so it doesn't generate a pulse with a systole and diastole like our hearts do. So generally, patients who are requiring a lot of support and flow from ECMO have no pulsatility. So they have an arterial line waveform that looks something like this. It's pretty flat. So when I want you to think of pulse pressure, I like to use the example of someone who has a map of 65 that can either be generated by a patient who has a blood pressure of 90 over 60 approximately, or they can have a blood pressure of 66 over 64. And a person who's requiring a lot of support from VA ECMO generally starts out somewhere like this. When a patient starts to have uh, increasing recovery of their left ventricle or increasing contractility, you start to see 
more of the difference between the systole and the diastole that uh, the patient's left ventricle is able to generate. So you go from having a flat waveform to starting to have a little bit of pulsatility between a difference between in systole and diastole. And eventually you'll start to see what looks like a normal arterial waveform. And that's something that you can quickly assess at bedside. It can change hourly, it can change daily on these patients, and it's something really important to keep an eye on. I want to briefly tell you about some common problems with ECMO circuits. Again, this is something that we can talk about a little bit more in our more advanced ECMO talk. But just so you are aware of, obviously, there can be cannula site issues, uh, particularly bleeding, given that the size is close to a garden hose. Um, you can have things like limb ischemia, GI bleeding, and strokes that can be either ischemic or hemorrhagic. And then just a special point, because I know, unfortunately, as medical students, you do have to be involved in, in codes or cardiac arrest from time to time. A special point that you should know for patients who are on VA ECMO, they do not need to get chest compressions. So... Um, Again, we talked about how that's both a heart and lung bypass machine. So patients who have a functioning VA ECMO circuit should not get chest compressions because you uh, run the risk of actually dislodging those cannulas and taking them off the support um, that is actually bypassing their heart and lungs already. So I hope uh, that this gives you a basic overview of, of everything you need to know and or at least the basics that you'll need to know before you take care of your first patient with ECMO. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure this will help somebody taking care of their first ECMO patient. And for everybody listening, if you are interested, we'll probably be making a more advanced ECMO video as well. So let us know what you'd like to know for that, or if you have any other cardiology specific topics that you'd like covered.